Hello, and welcome to Traditions of Grace. I'm Pastor Darren Vick, Senior Pastor at Community of Grace Lutheran Church, and I am so delighted you've chosen to join us for worship today. In just a moment, you will be experiencing a traditional worship service that includes elements from our pre-recorded worship services of the past, along with our most recent sermon from our current sermon series. It is my hope that you would know the love of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship together. And now, welcome to worship. And so I'd like to invite you to please rise if you're able for our opening hymn, When Peace Like a River, as we remember God's faithfulness with us through all the storms of life. No matter where we're coming from today, as we gather together, we gather around the same hope. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First John 1 tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise from the Word of God, I invite you in this moment to silently confess your sins before your God. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy sent Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in celebrating the truth of that promise and our hymn of praise. Fantastic. Well, welcome, church. It's good to be in your living room <laughs> for the 24th week. This is 24 weeks, Dan. Wow. 24 weeks that we have been coming to you this way and gathering during these very strange times. But uh, I'm blessed to know that you are there, you are present, and more than ever, I'm glad to know that Jesus is present with all of us as we continue to serve and follow him. Well, week 24, that means next week is week 20. Five, yep, can keep up that counting. And the following is week 26. That'll be exactly half of a year that we will have been meeting this way. And that's where we're getting ready to make some changes. We are getting ready to come into the fall, so I want you to pay attention. These are our next steps as we get ready to make our way into the fall season. Starting with our schedule on Labor Day Sunday, okay? Sunday, September 6th, will be a Sabbath rest Day. That means the 9 and 10.30 a.m. services will be online only. There will be no services hosted at Community of Grace Lutheran Church on Sunday, September 6th. Okay, We are using that as a day of rest. There will be a video that will be pumped out for you. <laughs> pumped out for you. Actually, it will be produced for you to be able to appreciate. And it's going to teach you about Sabbath as we celebrate that Sabbath rest together. It's important to do that and good to do that on Labor Day weekend. 
So that is September 6th. No services on site, but two services streamed online at 9:30 and or 9 and 10:30 a.m. Then our fall challenge as we move into a new season, a new worship schedule. Sundays beginning September 13th, there will be a 9 a.m. live stream service only, just like we've been doing. So that will stay consistent, a contemporary service at 9 a.m., live streamed only. Then at 10.30 a.m., there will be a traditional service in the sanctuary. At, uh, uh, it'll also be live streamed. Um, it will be presented the same way that we have been presenting it throughout this summer uh, with uh, a little abbreviated service. It will have uh, all of the COVID protections will be put in place. There will be Holy Communion every Sunday celebrated within that space. Um, and I want to issue a special invitation. You know, as we started coming into this season of the unknown, uh, I told all of you who were 65 and older that it would be really the very best if you would stay home and enjoy these services via online. And I'm so grateful that you did that. I think it's helped us to move to this place and time. But here's the invitation. If you are any age and would like to come and worship with us at the 1030 traditional service, you are welcome to come beginning on September 13th. And here's the deal. We are going to continue to practice social distancing. We are asking all staff members and all participants and congregants to wear masks to be with us. Anybody can wear a mask for 45 minutes. So come join us as you feel comfortable on that day. Or you can continue to watch it live streamed at 10.30 a.m., the traditional service as well. Then here's the newest thing that is coming your way, what we are calling worship gatherings. On the second, third, and fourth Sundays of the month, there will be a 10.30 a.m. worship gathering. It'll be outdoors as weather permits, but if the weather is inclement, we will move our way indoors into the fellowship hall, okay? So we're opening that back up again to come into the fellowship hall. His kids will have a children's ministry time in the children's ministry center that corresponds with those second, third, and fourth Sundays. And the service is going to be a little bit different. I won't tell you all about it right now, but I'll just let you know that that worship gathering is going to be a little bit different. We're having to make some adjustments as we come indoors again. So we are also asking participants when you come indoors to wear masks and be prepared to engage with Jesus in some creative ways as we follow him in mission. And then on the first Sundays beginning October 4th, we will continue to have grace gatherings off campus um, and uh, encouraging people to be meeting in their small groups or their pods as they feel comfortable and drive through communion. So every first Sunday of the month, drive through communion. You can come right on down at the conclusion of the 1030 service. So at 1130, you're welcome to come and join us for Holy Communion in a drive through way. Well, friends, we have been off the map for a while. It's been kind of a long summer and a long stretch of time that we've been away from each other. But we've been learning on this journey, too, outside of our comfort zones in places that we're unfamiliar with, but we trust that God is leading us. And while we're on this path, while we're heading off our map and up into the mountains, we've been taking some time to learn some new skills some new habits, and bringing along the right tools to make sure that we're prepared as best as we can and equipped the way that we need to be for the mission that God has for us. It's all about the mission, friends. At the end of the day, the mission goes on. No matter how we meet, where we meet, or how often we meet, God's mission moves us forward to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ. We just need to learn some new ways of doing that, and that's what we've been looking at throughout the course of this summer. We started off talking about skills, and then for the last several weeks, we've been talking about tools. And over the course of just these last couple of weeks and leading into this week, we've been talking about a particular set of tools that I call the trio of tools. These are tools that belong together and need to be worked with together and are very, very essential we started off by talking about faith. Last week, Pastor Angie led us to discover faith and faith in Jesus and how important it is to be faith-filled and faithful on this journey because we have a Lord who is faithful to us, a good shepherd who loves us and cares for us and calls us by name, and we recognize his voice and follow where he leads us. He is faithful to us, and we respond by being faithful to him. Then there was hope. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about hope, the importance of hope, that hope's not just some sideline or some little sister to faith. In fact, it's the building blocks of faith. To have hope is that starting point of seeing what God is up to and knowing that he is good. 
Where does that faith come from? Well, it's not an earthly faith. It's a faith that, faith that comes when we put our trust in the character and promises of God. That's where we find our hope. And that's all found in God's word. So we're taking time to look through passages of scripture that remind us of who God is, his loving kindness, his faithfulness, his compassion, his mercy, his goodness, all of those things that are towards us. That's the starting place of hope. Listening to those promises and hearing from God's word. So today, that brings us to the third of the big three. Faith, hope, and love. Today we're talking about love. And love of the three of these is the greatest. Now that's not just my opinion. That's right from scripture. Where the apostle Paul talks about this gift of love. From 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what Paul has to say. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away the, the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. If you've heard that before, there's a good chance that you heard it at a wedding. <laughs> I performed a wedding just this past week, and sure enough, once again, this passage of Scripture was read as a part of the service. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to give the impression that somehow love doesn't apply to marital love and the way that we connect with one another in that precious and beautiful way. But the context here that Paul is speaking of is something we need to be aware of when we come to this passage. You see, the reason that Paul has to put such an emphasis on this is because he was not seeing love in his church. The church at Corinth was divided and being split in all sorts of different directions. Directions that they all thought were good, that they all thought were noble, looking at the gifts of the Spirit and deciding that these were paramount, even competing with one another over these gifts. Oh, one has the gift of tongues, but another has the gift of prophecy. Oh, another has the gift of wisdom, another of knowledge. All of these different gifts. Wonderful gifts from God. But Paul wants to be absolutely clear. None of that matters if it's not done in love. Love must be present. It must be present for prophecy to have meaning. It must be present for tongues to have a purpose. It must be present for faith to move mountains. It must be present to be one who serves and sacrifices for the sake of others. Because without love, all of those things are just human actions. It's a hard word. It's a straightforward word. And a word we need to hear. And this version of love, this isn't a childish kind of love. Now, don't get me wrong. Children are wonderful. And to have a child come and express their love to you is a beautiful, incredible gift. But there's a difference between childhood and acting childish. As adults, we are not called to have a childish love, an unreflective love. We need a love that is strong, a love that is rooted in something other than ourselves, a mature love, a grown-up love, the kind of love that holds up 
The kind of love that can't fail. It's this kind of love that Jesus talks about when he gives his disciples what we've come to call the great commandment. If you haven't heard it before, it's okay. You can look it up in the Gospel of John. Others, it might be very familiar to you. Simply put, it's this. When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus responded by saying to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. A vertical love, a mature love towards God, towards the one who has created us, redeemed us, and loves us. And then a love that goes out horizontally to the people around us, sharing that love and receiving that love back as we ourselves are loved. It's a powerful image, but it's not just a romantic image. It's a real image of the kind of love that we are called to live in. It's an anchored love, love that's like an anchor. Now, before I go on talking about an anchor, I want to be clear. Was I brought this to my staff, Dan Lugo heard me say that love is like an anchor, and he knows we're talking about going into the mountains, and he said, why do we have a boat anchor in the mountains? Good question, but it's not a boat anchor. It's the kind of anchor that climbers use to make sure that they are fixed strongly to the side of the mountain. These anchors are often drilled into place with huge bolts or they're wedged in between pieces of rock that have no chance of moving and are immovable. These are anchor points for climbers to be able to cling to, hold on to, and trust knowing that it's not moving anywhere. That's like God's love on the mountain. It's like that anchor point. But then, of course, it takes something to connect you to the anchor. And what do you need to connect to the anchor? Well, you need some climbing rope. Rope like this, strong rope, rope that goes up and connects into that anchor and then comes down and ties itself into you so that in the event that you slip or you fall or your footing gives way, the anchor is there to catch you and to hold you. But that rope, in many cases, isn't just connected to you and to the anchor. Oftentimes, it's connected to other climbers as well. If you're a tandem climber or if you're a mountain climber, especially in some of the most challenging mountains in the world, like K2 and Mount Everest, as climbers make their way up the mountain with a Sherpa to guide them, they connect to anchor points that have been placed throughout the mountainside, Sherpa knowing exactly where to go to with each one of those anchor points, guiding and leading the people along with them. But that rope is connected to them, and then it's connected to each and every one of the climbers. They're connected to one another, so that in the event any one of them should slip from where they are, they're connected to the rest of the team to hold them up and to keep them safe. So there's an anchor to God that we are connected to, and then a connection to one another, the rope making its way through all of us, tying us together on this journey. That's a great image, isn't it? Being connected and anchored in God, connected in love to one another, a vertical love that is strong, a horizontal love that is powerful. And that's good. But what about others? What about those outside of our family, outside of our church, out into our community? How do we connect with them? How do we see them? And how does God see them? Well, that's the kind of love that becomes the greatest love. And in order to express that love, I want to read to you from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, starting at verse 43. These are the words of Jesus. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? 
Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is a different kind of love. And it's a love that Jesus still directs us to uphold. Not just loving those who we know and are comfortable with, but loving the unlovable, and even to the point of loving our enemies. There's no more challenging passage in Scripture to me than this. I mean, really. Don't think about this in the abstract as those enemies just out there somewhere. I want you to think about the person or people who have hurt you the most. The situation or circumstance that brought you the greatest hardship that came directly through the actions or the words or the inactions of another human being. A person who you could rightly call your enemy. What do you do with that? How are we supposed to love that enemy? It's not easy. It's certainly not easy for me. I realize what it's like to look at someone or some circumstance with such anger in my heart. Several years ago when my family moved down to Sioux City, Iowa. We had to leave behind our home up here. And unfortunately, we were underwater with our loan, as so many people were in that particular time. So we weren't able to sell our house. So for four years, we rented out our home up in the Twin Cities while living in another home down in Sioux City. Yeah, we were pretty much land barons. Not really. There was no income coming from the rental property Yes, we got rent paid in, but it never matched that which had to go out to take care of the property. And over the course of time, we had some renters who were good, some renters who were a little more of a challenge. But there was one set of renters in particular that I'll never forget. It was a set of renters that after being in the space for a little over a year, started falling behind in their payments. As the rental company that we were working through up here reached out to them, they would let us know that they were not getting these payments, and if they didn't get their payment, we didn't get our payment, and that it was important for us to start reaching out to this family. So we tried. We reached out. After they got a couple months behind, we reached out and said, hey, you know what? We realize times are hard. Things might be difficult for you. We're willing to work with you to see if there's some way, even if you can only come up with half of it this month. Let's just get back on track and start moving forward. And they promised us and told us, yep, that's exactly what we're going to do. We'll send you the first half, the beginning of the month. Thank you. Well, the beginning of the month came. The beginning of the month left. And so did they. They packed up all of their belongings in the middle of the night and left, leaving the home vacant. But not just vacant. See, when we went to go up and check on the home, the home that had been a home for us, not just a house. It was a disaster. It was filthy dirty. There were old clothes strewn all about the house, old dirty diapers, boxes filled with trash, garbage everywhere, a kitchen with a refrigerator filled with rotting food. And a few signs around the house of how they had been living, including a bullet laying on the floor. And many different items that they had purchased that were well outside of somebody who was falling behind in their rent. One of those items in particular was a vacuum cleaner. And not just any vacuum cleaner, it was a Dyson vacuum cleaner. A vacuum cleaner worth probably four or five hundred dollars. I'd never owned a four or $500 vacuum cleaner. But there it was, sitting in the house. It wasn't working, so I brought it home and tinkered with it and messed with it. And sure enough, I got that Dyson working again. It's still in our house, vacuuming our house to this day. And to this day, Angela and I call it our $10,000 vacuum. Because that's what it cost. But the reality was... As I walked through this journey, saw what had happened to our house, saw the way these people had disrespected a place that we cared for and were trying to offer, and skipped out in the middle of the night owing us thousands of dollars, 
I was angry. Angry in ways that I hadn't been angry before. Feeling cheated. Frustrated. And anger focused directly at these people. How dare you do this to us? These people felt like enemies. And I had no place in my heart to show them love. I don't know if you have any kind of a similar story with some challenge that you faced in your life, but this challenge that Jesus puts before us is not some hypothetical. It's real. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How are we supposed to do that? How can I love those who have hurt me and who have done damage to things that I love and care about and people that I love and care about? Well, Jesus even tells us within this passage. He gives an answer for us. Are you ready? Here it is. Be perfect. Just be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. If that within you causes you to say, I'm just going to really have to try harder to love people, I ask you to stop. Stop right there. And with all those feelings that you have felt of anger and of frustration, realize how imperfect you are and how imperfect I am. In those places of recognizing how far we have fallen how much we don't carry love in our hearts, not only for our enemies, but even for those who are close to us, thinking selfishly or being focused in on ourselves. Jesus raises the ante on what it means to love by saying to love your enemies and be perfect. And none of us can. None of us can. Because only God can love an enemy. And that first enemy that God loved was you and me. See, Jesus can share this because he was the son of God. Jesus can speak of the perfection of his heavenly father and his heavenly father's perfect love because only God can love perfectly. And that is exactly the kind of perfect love that God poured out on us through Jesus. You can't possibly love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You won't then love your neighbor as yourself, let alone your enemies. But God's love is towards you when you were his enemy. And towards me when I was his enemy. And in that place of God's love, everything was renewed and everything changed. What does this love mean? Well, listen to these words from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Friends, if you've been striving to try and put up enough love before God that you think that finally he will accept you, realize he sent his son Jesus, finding you exactly the way you are, the broken person that you are and the broken person that I am. And he loved you just the same through your betrayal, through your turning your back on him, through the sins small and large, the ones that we confessed before, 
the realities of our existence. Jesus' love was there for us before we ever made a move of love towards him. That's how great is the Father's love for you and for me. It's an overwhelming kind of love. It's a love that sees us as we really are and chooses to love us anyway. That kind of love isn't something we whip up ourselves. That kind of love is the love we bow our knee before. Open our hearts to. Confess our desperate need for. And then let the work of the Holy Spirit come into us. God's love coming into us, being born again, born anew of his spirit. So that that love can begin to show through us to one another as we know that we are loved. When you begin to see others the way God sees you, you can start to love others the way God loves you. So it begins by recognizing that we're all in this together, that the closest friend and the most vile enemy share this in common, a broken humanity, one that God has given everything for. That's the kind of love that will sustain us on this journey. That's the kind of love that will anchor us to the mountain. That's the kind of love that will link us together as one. And that's the kind of love that always has another hunk of rope waiting for someone else to grab hold of if you'll only offer it to them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we only love because you loved us first. And your love speaks all throughout the scriptures, through every story, Lord. We see your love at work. Something so alien to us, a kind of love that we could never share with one another perfectly, but a love that perfectly loves us right where we are. Lord, I thank you for that love. Now, Lord, as we come before you broken and in need, we confess our need for your love to make us clean, for your forgiveness to make us whole, for your kindness to work a miracle in our hearts of faith. Lord, you can do that work right now in the lives of anyone who is listening. And wherever you are, if you need to bow your knee before this God of love, do it right now, knowing that he is waiting and looking and seeing you where you are, saying, my child, you are the one whom I love. Receive that love, know that forgiveness, and let it propel you off the map into the wilderness and up the mountain together. We pray this, friends, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, wherever you are, as you prepare to move forward, let's pray together. The words that Jesus taught us so you can participate in this way at home. Let's unite our voices together this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
let us profess together our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in the closing verse. Go in peace, serve the Lord.